struggle. I want to live a life that is full and creative, but I am constantly getting in my own way. How? By filling every still moment with more movement, more doing, more thinking, which is the very thing that keeps me stuck and feeling less creative, especially when I face complex challenges. And that's a problem. Because we live in a society where everyday demands on our life are growing more complex. This challenge, this struggle, is so integral and such a constant teacher for me that I've made it my life's work, not only for myself, but in helping individuals and teams thrive in a complex world with more grace, more creativity. This journey for me started 20 years ago when I ran right into a brick wall. 1996, I live in Buenos Aires. My husband is back in Montreal. I fly twice a week between Brazil and Toronto, armed with my engineering degree, a Harvard MBA, a job in a top management consulting firm, flying six, seven times a week. I am somebody. I am making things happen. <laughs> Sleep, it's overrated. I can power through any physical fatigue. 30 years old, time to have children. I get off the pill. Nothing happens. I don't ovulate. I try a few things. Still nothing. Six months later, I'm worried. My sister, she's a gifted physician, takes me to every specialist she knows to fix this. Until one says to her, one doctor, there's nothing wrong with your sister's body. There's just no space in her life for a baby. And another one says to me, just like animals in survival mode, you're shutting down your reproductive system to deal with the overload in your life. Now, if you had asked me at that moment if I was under stress, I would have said no. I could not feel nor hear the warning signs of my own body. But out of despair, I slowed down just enough to create just enough space to get pregnant. Great, I did it. Now, nine months to go, time to get back in my performance mode. Go, go, go. <laughs> Seven months later, I'm holding her son, stillborn. I feel defeated, as if someone's laughing at me out there. I'm doing a lot, I'm running fast, I'm trying hard. But if I had been honest with myself, nothing, nothing had really shifted. And I wasn't very creative in any domains of my life. Even though I was out there performing, I could not conceive of anything different. I could not bring forth new life. And nothing, nothing mattered more. I see today how it felt too vulnerable to let stillness really enter my life. I was stuck in this pattern of efforting, trying again and again with the same doing, the same thinking, hoping for a different outcome. So why? Why did I get so stuck? Why do we often get so stuck? Here's what I've come to realize. The challenge lies in the polarity between movement and stillness. In movement, we think, we act, we initiate, we express our will, we participate in the world, and the world responds. Movement is essential, and there's many forces inviting us into moving faster and faster, more technology, more information, more options. The trap is that we can easily overdose on movement. It may look like this. Upon waking, we have our most still creative moment of the day. And what do we often do? We give it away to the first email we can find, 
we put on our badge of multitasking and join up for the busy world. After a while, we start to feel uh, a bit tense, anxious, reactive, and pretty quickly we find ourselves running right into habit. Once in our hamster wheel, we lose our agility to adapt and be creative because there's no space nor time to see differently. In stillness, on the other hand, we, we breathe. We feel calmer. We open to insight. We gain elevation. And from there, we might be able to see more clearly, hold multiple perspective, catch a glimpse of the future, even touch a sense of belonging to something bigger beyond our achievements. And there's a need for more stillness today. There's a reason why we have more than 100 apps on our phones to teach us how to meditate. <laughs> Mindfulness, right at the checkout counter. 3,500 studies to convince us. Yet, despite all of this help, research recently published in the Harvard Business Review shows that we now have an epidemic of adults diagnosed with self-induced ADT, attention deficit trait. We send our bodies into crisis and shut down our own capacity for intuition and creativity, which is likely why creativity has been rated by a global poll of CEOs as the number one most in demand, yet often most scarce leadership competency. So why is that? Because most of us see movement and stillness as an either or choice, either on or off, act or reflect. And it leaves us feeling this constant tension of never having enough time to either do it all or to be still, especially as demands on our life grow more complex. But there's another way to experience our life, by shifting to a both stillness and movement mindset. Because the reality is there's a natural self-correcting tension between the two, just as there is between the out-breath and the in-breath. If we resist it, go too far into the extreme, we fall into the downside, our hamster wheel. But if we restore the natural flow between the two, we then get the benefit of both. We regain our agility to be creative and adapt while staying in action, facing challenges. Just like an eagle caught in a turbulence who becomes really still to catch the wind and glide higher with grace and beauty. Now, we know more about practicing stillness separate from the game of life. But how do we do it while staying in the game? Especially in the heat of our toughest interactions when facing complex challenges. We've all been to, in one of these dialogues where what looks like a great debate is actually a match of I am right and you are wrong, back with an arsenal of facts, data, opinions, and underlying fear. I'm in one of these recently as a team coach. The CEO and the CFO are debating how to get operating results back on track. Productivity is down. It's putting at risk the merger of two companies. One argues to close plants, the other one to reallocate resource, both options suboptimal, too much relocation costs. The two are spinning in their separate hamster wheel. The tension's rising. After a while, I them both just to stop, pause, I invite them to notice what they feel, but not to answer. What they really want, but not to answer. What they could both possibly be missing. As they let go their need to be right, they become 
still, listening more deeply. You can feel the difference. It's as if time slowed down and there's more space in the dialogue. Paradoxically, the stillness invites a new quality of movement, asking different questions, looking for the missing perspective, more connection. They gain elevation, and all of a sudden, they notice a new pattern in the data. Absenteeism, project delays, has been trending down, actually trending up. And they realize that maybe, maybe, there's a lot of fear and anxiety in the employee base. So what do they do? They end up clearing up their schedules and experimenting with planned visits, listening, soliciting ideas. And that made all the difference. Productivity went back up, costs went down, employees really re-engaged, helping the merger go smoothly. Now, everyday challenges are growing more complex. Caring for aging parents, raising successful children, health, social, financial issues, lots of interconnected moving parts, no easy answers. And the point of the story is that we can more effectively navigate complex challenges when we let stillness meet movement, creating space within ourselves, within the dialogue, for something new to emerge, new solutions. But that's often uncomfortable for most of us. So why is that? Why do we resist letting stillness meet movement when the stakes are high? <coughs> most often, because we are afraid. And I've come to realize that when I am stuck in my wheel, I do not even know that I am afraid. I'm so used to it. But here are my warning signs. I start to tense up. My head moves forward. My shake goes stronger. And then I interrupt. I repeat myself, I interrupt. And I can sometimes, sometimes I can become bossy. <laughs> sometimes. Your signs may be different. Maybe you withdraw, maybe you shut down, maybe you procrastinate. But why? Why do we ignore these warning signs? I believe at the root of this is our desire to outrun our deeper feelings. Here's what the voice of my fears sounds like. I don't want to be still, so keep moving. I may not be understood, so keep talking, keep explaining. I may not be able to fix it and make it perfect, so keep trying. And then I may not be needed. And if I'm not being needed, how can I be worthy or belong? Can you imagine with the voice of these fears, how often I got in my own way writing this talk, not wanting to let go of the safety of my logic? It was miserable. Now, we each have our story. But regardless of age, gender, tenure, title, culture, Nobody is alone in their fears. Fear is actually what gets us into movement. But it can quickly become what keeps us stuck into habit when we try to fight it away. And yet, what will most surely melt that fear in the moment of the tension is stillness. I'd like to get back to where I started with my story. In our darkest moment of loss, my husband and I retreated to the snowy Canadian Rockies in search of some healing. And I remember this sunny morning, venturing into the backcountry, surrounded by so, so much beauty, yet I could not feel it. And I realized that part of me is numb, hardened. And that is when I made the serious commitment to practicing stillness into my life. Ditching my iPod so I could feel nature while jogging, creating space without email, deep breathing, yin yoga, and yes, even, even daily meditation. I started to trust with my heart what my mind could not yet understand. And life answered with the birth of my two beautiful daughters. Both born with 
without a change in career, nor context. <laughs> and both here today in the audience. We've made the mountains our permanent home for the last decade, and they continue to be my best teachers. Nature doesn't struggle with complex change. It embraces it, using this continuous loop of movement and stillness of growth and renewal to constantly adapt, evolve, transform. So I would like to leave you with an app that I created to remind myself. Yes, I know, another app. <laughs> now, this one is an acronym. A stands for awareness, becoming aware of our warning signs, our body sensations, our fears, our habit, before, before they become screams. P is for pause, pause, stop, interrupt the habit, even if we don't know where it will lead us. And the last P is for practice. Practice builds capacity. We can practice right now if you want. I invite you, if you want, to notice if you're holding your breath, allowing it to become fuller, just opening to receive and listen. But the point the point is not to turn this into one more thing on our to-do list. It is to integrate it as a way of life. One moment is all it takes. Before answering the phone, before entering a meeting, and ultimately right in the midst of our toughest interactions. Because when we let movement meet stillness, we open to more space. New possibilities emerge, and we can discover our way to new solutions. And that is at the heart of living a life that really matters. <laughs>